Great. I'm going live. Now we're live. Go for it. Great. Thanks. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Radiation Bells in Space Physics Online Seminar Series. And my name is Wen Li from Boston University, and I'm the main convener of today's uh, RBSP Seminar Series. And the topic of which is about uh, radiation bells across the solar system. So here is the entire list of our RBSP Science Organizing Committee from all over the world. So if you'd like to propose any topic regarding the RDSP seminar series, please feel free to contact uh, any of us. So today it's our good pleasure to invite two excellent speakers, Quentin Ninon and uh, Emma Oldfield, to tell us about uh, radiation belts across the solar system. So during their talks, uh, please feel free to send the questions using the chat function in Zoom, and we'll try to uh, moderate the questions after both talks end. Okay, and let me uh, first introduce our first speaker, Dr. Quinton Ninon. So Quinton receives uh, his PhD degree from Onera in France, and his PhD thesis was on the study and the modeling of the radiation belts of Jupiter. And after graduation, Quinton continued the Galileo data analysis at Jupiter and was the lead author of the white paper submitted uh, to the Planetary Science Decadal Survey in 2020. So after a two-year postdoc at UC Berkeley and a six-month appointment in ESA Aztec, uh, Quinton is a permanent CNRS researcher at IRAP in Tolhouse, uh, Tolos since 2022, and he works on the space plasma physics and moon plasma interactions across solar system. Okay, with that, let's welcome Quinton to tell us about the energetic particle uh, measurements, time variability, and loss processes at the extra uh, terrestrial radiation band. Quinton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. When can you hear me and see my screen? Perfect, yeah, very good. Perfect, let me put that uh, full. So I'm gonna talk during 15 minutes-ish, maybe 20, and then uh, Emma is going to, to go on, and then we leave the questions for, for the end. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so yes, my name is Quentin Nenon. I work at uh, IRAP in Toulouse in France. Uh, and I would like to first uh, give credit to Frank Drake that you can see on the picture here, uh, because I think he's the first one to have discovered the, the radiation belts of Jupiter. Because in 1959, he pointed his radio telescope uh, to Jupiter and he observed the synchrotron radiation, uh, which is emitted by very energetic, like 10 MeV electrons, uh, and that we can see from Earth. And it's actually pretty funny that I put the title here, Extraterrestrial Radiation Belts. So everything that is beyond Earth. Uh, when you know that Frank Drake then uh, was much involved in everything that is extraterrestrial. So this is the first historical event I wanted to highlight. The second one is Voyager 2. Voyager 2 visited the Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And at this time, we realized that all the planets which are sufficiently magnetized in the solar system uh, have radiation belts. So it sounds like we have something universal here, at least in the solar system. So I have one slide on observations of the radiation belts from the ground, directly from Earth. Uh, so the first mean to, to achieve such observations is the synchrotron radiation. So it's a spontaneous emission uh, by electrons when they are accelerated. Uh, we do observe this synchron radi uh, synchrotron radiation from Jupiter. So it looks like that, uh, this image of the VLA here. So you can see it's very close to the planet itself, uh, within roughly four Jovian radii of the center of Jupiter. We have not detected synchrotron radiation at the other planets, uh, including Earth. Uh, so that's a topic we can talk about if you want. Uh, we are working on the modeling of the synchrotron radiation of the Earth radiation belts. But we may have some observations of the synchrotron radiation from radiation belts of stars, uh, basically saying that stars can trap and accumulate particles uh, in radiation belts. The second mean to observe the radiation belts remotely are X-rays. So here, this nice figure uh, put together by George Clark 
showing that we can basically detect X-rays when the energetic charged particles precipitate in the atmosphere uh, or on the moons, but also you have this uh, inverse content scattering so that you can clearly get an image of the radiation belt. Um, but most of what we know about the physics of the radiation belts actually come from the in-situ exploration. So at Jupiter, if we focus on the orbiters, we had the equatorial Galileo. We currently have Juno on the polar orbit around Jupiter, and the future is bright uh, because uh, Juice and Europa Clipper are almost ready uh, for launch. At Saturn, uh, well, so is everything working well? Yes. Yep, yep, sorry. Uh, at Saturn, we had Cassini, uh, a fantastic uh, mission uh, around the, the ringed giant. So Cassini remained close to the equator most of the mission, uh, except at the end when it went on a, a high latitude orbit to skim inside the rings. So we have basically observed uh, all the magnetosphere of Saturn. At Uranus and Neptune, uh, unfortunately, we have only the, the flyby of Voyager 2. Uh, but it's still better than uh, nothing. And all these spacecraft, they did have uh, instrumentation uh, of interest to understand the radiation belts. So energetic charged particles uh, detectors. So I'm not going to detail, but you can see some characteristics here. ENAs, energetic neutral atoms. So there was an ENA camera on board Cassini, uh, mostly for Saturn. And then we need a uh, context information uh, like at Earth. So we need to know the, the cold plasma, the plasma waves, and the magnetic field, of course. So the and for Voyager 2 here at the bottom right, uh, we also have a, a nice suite of instruments. The main limitations um, that we have so far is we don't have energy resolution for very energetic particles, uh, in particular at Jupiter. We know it is these particles that we, we should observe. Um, we don't have yet an ENA camera at Jupiter, but this is going to change uh, with uh, JUICE, and uh, no X-ray camera so far at the outer planets. So yeah, uh, just a little break uh, to put some cuteness here. Uh, so JUICE is ready for launch almost. Uh, launch is next month, so it's coming soon. And here you can see the the, the drawing that won the, the, the kit contest organized by ISA. And this uh, drawing is now on the, the fairing here of the Ariane 5 rocket. So this is going in space. And everyone is uh, smiling. And you can see that Jupiter is uh, nicely welcoming uh, Juice. OK, so today, uh, both Emma and I, it's impossible to describe everything about all the planets. Um, uh, but we are going to try to give an overview at least. But I would like to, to point to a few references. So I think the main message here is to say that everyone in the Earth radiation belts community is, of course, very welcome to, to join the uh, outer planet uh, radiation belt community. And if you want to start somewhere here, I've put a few references. Um, so for instance, this one, uh, this is a book chapter by uh, Elias Roussos and Peter Coleman. I can maybe quickly show it. It's just here. And so the, the objective here is to facilitate anyone who wants to start uh, working on this topic. You can see it's not very long and it's well organized. So you can see the, the physical processes at, at the two planets, so Jupiter and Saturn, how they work like CRAN, radio transport here, moon absorption, charge exchange, and so on. And then you have the average configuration of each type of radiation belts and the uh, time variability of the radiation belts at Saturn and at Jupiter. So we have this material uh, to then uh, so to, to, to help start in this uh, outer planet radiation belts. Uh, this nice uh, review by Solen, and then here uh, two papers, including a very recent one by uh, Ian Cohen on uh, Uranus. Uh, it's just a few, a few ones. OK, so. Based on all these observations, what do we know uh, about the radiation belts uh, beyond Earth? So it's going to be really an overview. But basically, the energetic electrons 
they basically look like one big belt. We don't have a slot like in the radiation belts of Earth, which depends on energy and sometimes can be filled. Um, but we don't see that clearly uh, for the energetic electrons at the other planets. So the main source of these energetic electrons should be somewhere in the middle and outer magnetosphere. Uh, then we need to define what we mean by outer magnetosphere. But something that was uh, revealed by Cassini at Saturn on the right is what we call zebra stripes. So when you see the, the flux as a function of energy and uh, L shell or L star or whatever you want, you see these kind of uh, stripes. Uh, even if at the moment it's not sure at all if the process which is creating this at Saturn is the same um, as is uh, occurring at Earth. This is an open question. Uh, and then we, we observe the, the, the spectrum, so the, the flux is a function of energy for uh, the electrons. And without any more introduction, here is the comparison between the, the five planets. So on the bottom, on the, the upper panel, sorry, so this figure is from uh, Barry's paper. Uh, each letter is a planet, so E is Earth, J is Jupiter. Uh, and the number gives you the L shell. So you can compare, for instance, E5 and J8. So you can see that the fluxes are, are quite similar below 1 MeV, but above 1 MeV, this is where uh, Jupiter, the king, uh, really kicks in. Uh, and one of the big questions that we have is what makes Jupiter so powerful for uh, the acceleration of electrons? Uh, then you can see the other planets. Um, there are many, many things to, to discuss here. But what I like is here, this uh, bottom panel. Um, this can be kind of technical, but uh, this is a kennel paycheck analysis. And when this uh, ratio here, uh, log 10 of this ratio gets close to zero, the information is that maybe the radiation belts are saturated, meaning the energy charge particles uh, try to, to, to generate electromagnetic waves, which limit the flux of energy charge particles. I don't know personally if the kennel paycheck limit concept is confirmed uh, or not at Earth after the Van Allen probes. So that's something we can discuss during the questions. Um, but then the question is also open for the uh, other planets, of course. But from this uh, plot of Barry here, it looks like most of the planets, uh, the radiation belts are saturated, except Saturn uh, that you can see is below. The time dynamics of the electrons, because here it was like a, um, it was like a, the global configuration. We see many different things. Um, at the outer planets, we have two words or two names that we call injections and interchange. Uh, I'm not sure we fully know what is the difference between the two. Um, but for the long-term variability of the radiation belts, we do have the measurements of the synchrotron at Jupiter since the 1970s. Uh, Cassini spent a long time at Saturn. And what we understand is that the, the long-term variability can be controlled maybe by the solar wind, maybe by the UV flux of the sun, or maybe by something internal like the volcanic moon Io or Enceladus. Uh, a lot of open questions. Uh, the ions. So when we speak about ions in radiation belts, the first thing that we have in mind are protons. Um, because I think they dominate the flux uh, at Earth and Saturn. This is not true at Jupiter. Uh, at Jupiter, you can see on this plot that we have a significant intensities of heavy ions. Um, and I would like to highlight that for Jupiter and Saturn, uh, Cassini and Juno have shown that we have uh, a source of kilo electron volt ions very close to the planets, which may be uh, ENA stripping. So you generate an ENA somewhere uh, that gets stripped by the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, it's only a proposition so far, but the, the observations are, are there. Uh, and for the ions, if we increase a little bit the energies, if we go to MeV, 40 MeV, 100 MeV, what we clearly see is the effect of the moons. So the moons uh, basically absorb the particles. So along the corridor, of the moon, you can see uh, a strong reduction uh, of the fluxes. 
And so the MEV protons that we see in between the orbits of the moons, uh, like here on this uh, cartoon on, on the left, they should come from a local source. So at Saturn, this uh, local source is identified to be crowned. So I'm going to talk about crowned at the end. Uh, and at Uranus, um, Ian Cohen uh, recently uh, did a reanalysis uh, of the measurements of Voyager 2, and they found that it can be crowned in between the orbits of Miranda and Ariel, uh, but it can be also something else. Um, not sure what is happening here. Uh, I'm going to skip this one for the sake of time. Uh, so the, the time dynamics of the ions. I have one slide on models because so far I have mostly talked about uh, measurements. Uh, so we have two big families of models like at Earth. So the empirical models to specify the environment. So the, the JPL models and the, uh, there is one uh, in Europe uh, developed by Onera. And then you have the, the physics based model. So it's mostly Foucault Planck uh, formalism. So we have the Salambo model at Onera, uh, and then you have the different institutes here, uh, including uh, the models of EMA. Um, but the good news is that hopefully we have more models coming uh, soon. Uh, I have seen the presentation uh, in a conference by uh, Sasha Drozdov uh, working on Saturn as well. So hopefully more and more people will develop models uh, and maybe with a different formalism than just uh, Foucault Planck. And so now, uh, Emma and myself, we are going to talk about physical processes, um, how the physical processes operate uh, in radiation belts which are not Earth and in a magnetosphere which is not Earth. Uh, the big questions are what is universal, what is actually happening at all the planets. And so we can say, OK, this should also happen uh, for extraterrestrial, uh, extrasolar, sorry, uh, planets. Uh, but conversely, what is specific to each planet? Uh, so th these are open questions on which we are working. Uh, but the big physical processes and questions that we have, um, it's the origin of the particles first. Basically, you have small charge particles. They should come from somewhere. They can come from the sun, uh, from outside uh, the heliosphere, so galactic cosmic rays, from the atmosphere of the planet, or uh, from moons. Uh, then Emma is going to talk about uh, radial transport uh, processes and acceleration of the particles. And I will have just one or two slides on uh, the loss uh, of the particles. So yes, here I have put in purple uh, the GCR because I'm going to talk quickly about crown in one slide. Uh, and it's really the objective here is to compare the different planets. So Earth, um, so I may be wrong, so don't hesitate to, to let me know after, but I think at Earth, Crown, so the cosmic ray albedo neutron decay, is a source of MeV protons close to the planet and uh, maybe quasi-trapped KV electrons. At Jupiter, we have so far never detected, uh, de de detected uh, Crown, so we don't know yet if it is because we did not have an instrumentation uh, able to observe Crown, or if it is because um, actually the magnetospheric flux, so coming from the magnetosphere, completely overwhelms uh, Crown, so that you will not see Crown at all. Uh, at source, uh, at, sorry, at Saturn, uh, once again, this nice cartoon showing that it is a dominant source of MeV protons. And at Uranus and Neptune, uh, it's an open question. Here you can see uh, this figure on the right, once again, from the nice paper of uh, Ian. And so when they put crown, so it is the second panel, uh, they get the, the blue, the green, sorry, uh, phase space density profile. And they look for something that looks like panel C. So they say the source cannot be uh, this blue source. It should be this one in panel C. Um, I'm not sure it completely closes the question. It can still be crowned. Um, but basically, we just have the measurements of Voyager 2, so it's hard to, to conclude. And loss processes, <coughs> I'm not going to detail everything, um, but basically, we have the moons that can absorb uh, the rings, the dust, magnetopause shadowing, 
charge exchange uh, with natural particles and Coulomb collisions, uh, the atmospheres of the planet, the synchrotron, we lose energy, basically. Um, and uh, Emma is going to talk about uh, waves. But I would like to, to finish on this slide to say that if we want to understand the, the source and the loss processes, um, and here specifically the, the loss processes, we need to combine uh, data and modeling. And now the question is, OK, how do we model that? How can we model and understand the loss processes? And for that, there is a, a handbook, which is being prepared by uh, Peter Corman and uh, Sasha Drozdov. And in this handbook, hopefully this year or next year, we will have a chapter uh, where we plan to give all the equations. So for instance, if you want to implement by yourself the loss of energy due to synchrotron, then you just go in this chapter and there it is. If you want to implement the um, absorption rate due to moons, then it will be there. And so that's it for me. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to let the floor to, to Emma. Thank you, Quinten. And uh, as uh, mentioned, we're going to do the Q&A part after both talk ends. And then let me introduce our second speaker, Emma Woodfield. So Emma received her PhD degree from the University of Leicester in UK in 2002. And regarding the uh, ionosphere and the magnetosphere physics at the Earth using ionosphere radars. So from 2002 to 11, she worked on a broad range of topics on the Earth's ionosphere and magnetosphere physics using both data analysis and models. And since 2012, Emma has been working at the British Antarctic Survey, where she moved topic to perform radiation bed modeling at the Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn, particularly about the uh, wave particle interactions. So with that, I'd like to give the floor to Emma to tell us about the acceleration and the loss in the radiation belt of the solar system. Emma, thank please feel free to share your screen. Yeah. Thank you very much, Wen, and thank you, Quentin, for the, the brilliant introduction. So um, get the right thing going here. Okay, all good. Great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so I want to carry on from Quentin's really good introduction about the basics of what we what we know um, and what we don't know, uh, and try and talk about some of the specifics and, and particularly the differences that we see between um, between what we see at the planets and what we see at the Earth. That. So. So. so uh, in counterpoint to, to the losses slide that uh, Quentin showed towards the end there, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about sources, but specifically uh, the radial diffusion, um, radial transport, uh, and the cyclotron resonant wave particle interactions. Uh, actually, no, go back that. So the radial diffusion at Jupiter is um, well, very much similar to radial diffusion at the Earth. Um, and also at Saturn, but the, the one um, critical difference is that there is uh, the theory behind um, what causes the radial diffusion at Jupiter, at least, is that it's it's not down to um, ULF waves, it's down to um, uh, asymmetries in the atmospheric tides changing the electric field in the ionospheric dynamo region. Um, and consequently, the, the um, dependence on the L parameter um, for the radial diffusion is, is uh, somewhat lower than it is at the Earth. At least that's the theory. And at Saturn, um, we're not really sure. It could be either Earth-like or Jupiter-like, or it, yeah, we know very little about that really, to be honest. Um, so there's, there is, the overall process is similar, but the cause, the generating mechanism behind it, um, we're much less sure about at the planets. Um, right, and then I'm going to talk about uh, rapid adiabatic transport next, which I've sort of labelled convection, although you might want to call it advection, um, depending on uh, your background. One important thing to realise about this here is that uh, the magnetic fields of Jupiter and Saturn are upside down compared to the Earth. So the north and south poles are reversed. Uh, as a consequence of that, the electron drift, the magnetic and gradient gradient and curvature drift is in the opposite direction to that at the Earth, which is at the opposite direction to the co-rotation of the plasma at Saturn and Jupiter. 
So Saturn and Jupiter, the plasma co-rotation is very, very strong. And then we've got this energy dependent, um, charge dependent gradient and curvature drift, which is opposing that. Um, and there, there are energy ranges, well, there's an, an energy where that is um, precisely opposite. And we call that the stagnation, uh, the stagnation point where the co-rotation is exactly equal and opposite to the gradient and curvature drift for the electrons. Um, and where you're not going to drift around the planet, which is quite an important um, consideration, especially when you're trying to think about things like radial diffusion. Uh, but I won't go into that here. That's complicated. So the particles have stopped drifting, but there is a global electric field. So this is not at least at Saturn. So this is a Saturn example. Um, at Saturn, this global electric field is actually directed post noon to pre midnight. Um, so it's not quite a dawn dusk like you would see at the Earth, um, but it's nevertheless a, a large global scale, relatively small. We're talking 0.3 millivolts per meter electric field, and that gives its own uh, drift to the particles. Um, and so once you've got your stagnated particle from a magnetic point of view, the electric field, be it small, takes over and does some really, really interesting things with the particles. And so for the suggestion at Saturn, um, and for Jupiter as well, um, is that that is the origin of our zebra stripes, our Saturn and Jupiter's zebra stripes. Um, and so this figure from Howe in 2020 shows the kind of interesting shaped orbits that you can get once you've got this sort of stagnation energy or, or quite close to it, but actually further away than you might imagine, given um, given the um, naive look at the physics about it, it actually extends quite away from the, the, the stagnation energy. And so we have these uh, so-called banana orbits. Um, and you can see that these are crossing large tracts of L shells. Um, and, and obviously they're changing energy as they're doing it. This is an adiabatic process. Um, and so this can result in quite rapid adiabatic transport. Um, and so it, rapid in Saturn terms is several well, multiple L shells over a, a day or two, um, which is rapid for Saturn. Um, so, and so that's that's one the other radial transport that we have to consider in, to, in, in addition to the, the standard sort of radial diffusion idea of, of adiabatic heating. And talking of radial diffusion and adiabatic heating, so an analysis by Peter Coleman um, show there are broad regions where adiabatic theory matches observations. So this um, set of plots, one, one for Jupiter at the top and one for Saturn at the bottom, um, and you've got L shell going outwards. Note, note the very different scales here. Jupiter's off to 100 or so, um, and Saturn out of, out of 10. And this uh, cutoff energy is a, uh, a description of the, of the spectra that went into to you doing it. So there's a particular cutoff where the spectra sh sharply turned downwards. And that's this measure on the on the y axis here. And the important things to note on here are the orange line, which shows you what the adiabatic um, radial diffusion transport process would give you in terms of that cutoff energy. Um, and the blue measurement, the blue line here is the median um, value of all, all the points in the background there. So you can see there are a large range where that orange line matches up with the wiggly blue one. Um, both for, for Saturn and for Jupiter. And that is where we were relatively confident that the, the adiabatic heating process is probably the dominant. There may be others, but that's probably the dominant process. But you can also see there are um, interesting regions, particularly at the inner edge um, at Jupiter over here. We're getting into around about sort of 15, 15 Jovian radii, which is in, coincidentally where a lot of the waves start to, to be quite important. Um, where the, the adiabatic theory and uh, the, the measurements don't really align up very well. And of course, there's some similar interesting um, that's going on at the outer edge at, at Saturn over here. Um, so, so the adiabatic theory works well, the radial diffusion works well, but not everywhere. There's also a very wide variability in the data. So you'll all be very familiar uh, with the, the quasi-linear quasi theory, Fokker-Planck equation, method of looking at global radiation belt modeling. I just put it in here for a reminder. Um, and so this is the uh, simplified version with just the pitch angle and alpha energy and um, L shell, so the radial term here and some uh, a loss term to the atmosphere. Um, and it's important, it's always important to remember that there's, there's a lot of 
calculations that go into this. So the diffusion coefficients take up a lot of effort, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but we've got to remember that when it all combines back into the model, you've got to uh, factor into account uh, the gradients and the phase space density with each of these parameters as well. So F is the phase space density in here. Um, so it's a combination of those two, and, and we must remember to make sure that that, that is taken into account. So I mentioned the wave, uh, uh, the diffusion coefficients. So I'm just going to talk about the wave diffusion coefficients here. Um, so for the wave particle interactions, and these are the, the detailed ingredients, if you like, of what goes into the um, relatively complex uh, set of integrals and calculations that uh, give you those um, diffusion coefficients in pitch angle and energy. So you've got the, the details about the waves, the power, the frequency, where it is in the, in the magnetosphere, um, the wave normal angle. So that's the angle of the wave vector to the local magnetic field. Um, then you've got which charge particle you want to interact with the waves. So it's charge and it's mass. Um, and then you've got the sort of background parameters, the, the magnetic field strength, um, the global shape of the magnetic field, uh, the cold plasma density is very important. Um, and also um, the ion distribution in the background can be important as well, depending on which waves you're looking at. And so that, that is true for whichever planet you're looking at. Um, but when you move out to the outer planets, um, there are some interesting things that you have to be very careful about. So uh, the plasma waves, they're broadly the same. Obviously it's the same plasma physics. It's plasmas, it, it's a, the laws of uh, the plasma physics carry on. Um, but you get uh, more of certain types of waves and there's differences in all these um, in, internal parameters of the waves as well. Um, so although the physics, underlying physics is the same, there's a lot of differences in, in what's actually observed. Uh, for the charged particles, um, some are much heavier and you've got higher charge state ions. So sulfur double plus is very, very common. You can also get sulfur triple plus, you get water ions at Saturn um, and you can get much higher charge states than that even um, uh, close to the planet. So that's that's quite a challenge. Uh, obviously, the magnetic field strength is different, but also, as I mentioned earlier, the north and south poles are reversed. So that's a very important factor um, when we're thinking about the modeling. Um, and also the plasma density. The plasma density is very different, um, mostly due to the presence of uh, the moon plasma tori. So there's two moons in particular that give off um, a lot of plasma. So you've got Io um, at Jupiter, which gives up with the volcanic moon, gives us lots of sulfur dioxide and related um, related elements. And then at Saturn, you've got Enceladus, which gives off water related ions. And so both of those generate plasma tori um, and you have a very different plasma setup to um, uh, you get at the Earth. And in particular, some regions um, at the higher latitudes have extremely low density. Um, which changes uh, things quite a lot. So what do we know about the waves? Um, so I've put on the left um, uh, a, a top-down view of the Earth's uh, wave um, locations, if you like. So you've got the usual chorus over towards the dawn side. Um, you've got your left waves wiggling about around the edges, um, but obviously go all the way through. Then you've got magnetosonic, you've got EMIC, and you've got hiss um, in the plasma sphere. So that's a top down view. Now, Jupiter and Saturn, um, we haven't really dealt a great deal with the local time um, variation of the of the waves as yet. The data is there, but it's not really enough to make concrete uh, um, decisions about where where it's where particular waves are most dominant in local time. However, in, in latitude, we do have quite a bit more information. Um, and so. Uh, at the top, we've got Saturn, and at the bottom, we've got Jupiter. Uh, long lists of references have, have gone into these particular pots. And this is our current state of knowledge. That doesn't necessarily mean um, that these waves are uh, don't go further out. This is just as far as we've gone um, so far with the data. Um, so at Saturn, you can see um, you've got a good dose of whistler mode chorus. Um, you've got hiss, uh, whistler mode hiss occurring at higher latitudes. And that's mostly a consequence of this, this plasma tori density concentrated around the equator um, kind of idea. Um, you've got a permanent set of iron cyclotron waves, which are due to the pickup iron processes um, based on the ions that come out of Enceladus. And so those iron cyclotron waves, unlike 
the Earth's, which are uh, somewhat erratic in their um, occurrence, there's a 100% occurrence of ion cyclotron waves in a band of about two Saturn radii, um, uh, which is uh, very nice for, for doing rave work with. Um, we've also got uh, a nice chunks of Z mode and A mode, um, which you don't necessarily get in the same sort of setup as the Earth. And again, this is a consequence of the low, the very low plasma density in some regions of, of Saturn's magnetosphere. So that's what we know so far um, for Saturn. Oh, and I should mention there's a little red ring around Rhea. So Rhea is a moon just inside of nine Saturn radii. Um, and we know that that moon has a, a little burst of extra cores around it, amongst other waves. It has extra one waves around it as well. Um, and if we move down to the Jupiter picture at the bottom here, you'll see similar red rings around um, Europa and Ganymede, because we also know that those also have extra chorus waves um, associated close to the moons as well. Um, and then we've, so the Jupiter picture is somewhat less filled in. Um, as Quentin mentioned, um, the Galileo mission was primarily equatorial, so we know moderate amount of what happened near the magnetic equator. Um, the Juno mission is still filling in all the other gaps, hence the slightly wiggly bottom of the Whistler mode um, patch in here. Um, but as you might expect, there's a lot of chorus, there's a lot of hiss-like um, Whistler mode stuff going on there, and it goes up to quite high latitudes. Um, we have observed through the Juno um, mission um, Z and O modes at um, higher latitudes, close to the planet, but in a similar sort of way um, to Saturn as, as we expected really from the layout of the plasma density. Um, and we've also got some iron cyclotrons associated uh, with uh, various moons. It's not quite as clear a picture for the iron cyclotron as it is at Saturn, which is quite interesting. Um, but you can see there's some quite interesting iron cyclotron waves in here, sulfur dioxide iron cyclotron waves, for example. Um, and so this picture is still being filled in, but um, it's, it's looking very promising and certainly very interesting um, from a, a wave particle perspective. Um, so I said in the, in the title, um, I was going to talk about acceleration and loss, because really the wave, wave particle interactions give us both. And depending on what factors you what parameters you put in you can get both out um, and so the, the the picture at Jupiter um, and chorus so chorus at Earth is obviously a, a uh, it can can give you um, diffuse aurora um, and it can also give you nice beautiful acceleration and, and lumps in your and your phase space density when you've got a burst of chorus waves um, and give you lovely acceleration of the electrons so chorus waves obviously first point of call really when looking at other planets to see what it does. But Jupiter is really quite interesting. So um, there's a the study on the left, which I did some time ago now, um, looked, which is based, just based on the Galileo data. So we only knew really what the waves did up to about 10 degrees of latitude, magnetic latitude. Um, and we had to kind of make up what happened after that. Um, and basically we just assumed they went up to 10 degrees because we, we didn't know any better. Um, and we used a dipole field because that was easy. And this region of Saturn, uh, sorry, Jupiter is, is relatively dipole like. Um, so that wasn't an unreasonable thing to do. Um, and so um, we ran the simulation over, over some days, um, looking at the energy of, of a radiation belt. We started with a with an em we started with an empty radiation belt and the idea of what happens, how how might you build up um, uh, a radiation belt at about L of 10. Um, using waves. And so we've got injections of particles in here. So we have a little burst of injections every um, three days or so um, from Barry Malk's paper in 1999, I think that was. Um, and you can see there's a cumulative effect from the, from the calculations that we did. You do build up a radiation belt of a few MeV, which is just what we have and just what you need to be able to get those really high energy um, synchrotron electrons through radial diffusion um, ridden very close to the planet. But then if you do different uh, simulation. So uh, Tanimar Ma um, in 2020 uh, looked again at um, uh, the effect of the uh, chorus waves or whistler wave waves in general. Um, and these are pitch angle distributions showing the evolution over time. Um, so the, the starting points in, in black and the end points in red. Um, using constant chorus power up to a much higher latitude, so 50 degrees, where Juno has now shown us there are whistler mode waves. Um, and these particular simulations were done in a non-dipole field. Um, and you've got different energies in here. So you start quite low energy 
and then you end up at quite high energy and notice the time uh, bar on here is different for the two. And you can see an awful lot of effects. So you can get some scattering at the lower energies. You can get a bit of both at a 3 MeV. Um, and then by the time you get to 5.6 MeV, you've got quite a lot of acceleration, but you still get a bit of loss. So basically the picture is really quite complex. Um, and the more we find out from Juno, the more this will hopefully become clear. So uh, I just wanted to show um, some pictures of the plasma density um, as driven by the moon output for Jupiter and, and um, Enceladus. And so these are plots of the density in um, centimetres to the minus three um, on the top. And uh, I've got the ratio of the plasma frequency to the gyro frequency um, on the bottom panel, because that's a very important um, parameter when we're thinking about wave particle um, interactions. Um, the lower it goes, the, the more acceleration you typically ex expect. And so this wiggly pink line shows you where, uh, where the plasma to gyro ratio is actually equal to one. And that is pretty much lower than you get most of the time at the Earth anyway. But then it goes beyond that um, at Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, and so you've got a moon. Um, Jupiter, um, Io is just, just under six here, and you can see there's, there's the plasma that comes off the moon here. There's a couple of little um, quirky bits just inside of there um, as the torus sorts it out, sorts itself out with centrifugal forces, etc. Um, and Saturn um, Enceladus is just inside four, and so again you've got quite an interesting set of shapes of the density. And then when you um, factor in the, the uh, global magnetic field on top of that, then you get these these pictures in the plasma to gyro uh, ratio. So it's, it's significantly different to what from what we might have at the Earth, and that turns out to be actually quite important. Um, so, as Quentin said, we haven't got time to cover absolutely everything. So I've put in a couple of examples where things are sort of significantly different um, to what we see at the Earth. And so this is a, um, a study we did on the chorus interactions um, in very low plasma density uh, regions. And so the, the top left figure shows you um, a plasma density model um, from Saturn um, uh, with Enceladus again, just, just inside of four here. And that line showing you where the plasma to gyro ratio goes below one. So above it is below one. And then at the top, you've got the, the wave power from the chorus um, shown in the blue line at the top. And then underneath you've got uh, light blue shows you where the plasma is greater than gyro frequency. And the darker blue shows you where the plasma's now gone below the gyro frequency, which is again, it's a, it's a situation we very, very rarely have at the Earth. Um, and those uh, that, that density change gives you two different reactions or interactions between the chorus and the electrons at, at Sun. So if an L shell of six, uh, where uh, the waves really don't encounter much of um, a, a low density region, th these are a fairly typical chorus. Um, type reaction that you'd expect to the Earth. Um, and because the density, uh, the density to gyro ratio, et cetera, this is quite a slow, um, it is an acceleration process, but it's very slow. Um, however, once you start getting this low density region significantly coming, coming down in latitude, you get an extra set of um, resonances um, from when that, that plasma goes below the, below the gyro frequency. And these are off equator, um, and, and entirely in that, that plasma um, over gyro region uh, is less than one. And so you get an extra burst of diffusion there. And so that, when if you look at the pitch angle distributions from that, you get, so at the bottom, we've got a, a sort of more Earth-like chorus. It's very slow. This time scale on here is 500 days. Although do bear in mind that everything is slower at Saturn and Jupiter than it is at the Earth. Um, um, but if you go inside where you've got uh, some of this lower density region, you start to get very rapid acceleration and it is off equator. So you are looking towards having um, more butterfly shaped distribution, particularly at the higher energies. Um, so this is this is two MeV here. Um, so that's one one thing that was very different um, on those low density regions. Um, another thing that's quite different, the Z mode waves. Z mode waves we've tinkered with at the Earth. There's a couple of studies that look at Z mode wave and, and how it might actually be quite effective at accelerating electrons. Um, Saturn, as I showed you in the map earlier, has a massive blob of Z-made waves um, just there pretty much all the time. Um, so it, it plays a much bigger role in the dynamics of, of the radiation belt of Saturn. And particularly that, that um, 
inside uh, the orbit of Enceladus at about four, um, the dynamics of the magnetosphere are very slow. There's very few, if any, injections in that region. It's a very quiet region in many respects. There will be radial diffusion and there is lots of Z-mode waves. So we had attempted to do um, a comparison between she started with an empty radiation belt, that, that idea we've used before, um, and tried to fill it up using either radial diffusion um, or uh, just the Z-mode waves. And, and what would actually happen in, the, in that scenario um, to try and try and gauge the relative importance of the two different um, uh, mechanisms. It's quite hard to do. Um, but the, the bottom panel here shows uh, the, the results of what that did. And so we're looking at 365 days. That's Earth days. Um, obviously quite a long time. But as I said, this is a really slow, quiet region in Saturn's uh, magnetosphere and radiation belts. So that's actually not an unreasonable time um, for that particular region of space. And you can see the Z-mode waves do build things up to, to where um, the, the model of Saturn's uh, electron flux is, which is um, SatRad, I've included here. Oh, excuse me. Um, and at the bottom, we've, we've um, fed in the source at each of the main moons for the radial diffusion and it is building up as well but it, it's um not it's building up differently and um the the power of the waves is actually actually quite quite important um in that particular region inside so zedman waves um many more many more of them and they have really quite an important effect on the dynamics at uh, of the radiation belt so i'm going to take a quick quick look at some of the observations versus simulations that are, are out there um so the the work we've done with the, the so the Z mode uh, is also an off equatorial process because the Z mode likes to live in um, likes to propagate and exist in low density regions which are typically off the equator. So the Z mode is an off equator process. The strong chorus diffusion is an off equator process. The same also happens with the Hiss uh, at Saturn, which is even further off the equator. So these are all off equator. Uh, mechanisms for accelerating uh, the, the MeV electrons. And so what you get, or what you expect to get from the simulations at least, is a, a some sort of butterfly type pitch angle distribution where the, the peak of the pitch angle di distribution is off the equator in some format. Um, and thank for, thanks to um, some careful processing by Rana Al in 2021, we now have some um, pitch angle data from Cassini um, in, the, in the MeV region. Um, and uh, so Enceladus, for reference, is, is near four. Um, and so inside of there, where we're looking at um, Z mode and low density off equator chorus and hiss, we do indeed see um, what you might call butterfly type pitch angle distributions where the peak is away from the equator. Um, so that might well be a, um, uh, a signature of the, of the wave processes there. Um, and then going back to talking about losses, um, so a Jupiter. Um, Whistler mode waves are thought to be a potential driver of the diffuse aurora. Um, and um, some work here by Wenli um, showed a, a diffuse auroral region and, and the modelling to go with that to show you that. So if you look at panel E here, um, you've got the precipitation um, electric flux of the observation um, versus the model. And actually in that diffuse auroral region, um, it looks really quite a nice uh, comparison. And this is this is Juno uh, data in here, um, and also uh, Wen's also shown um, the Whistler mode waves uh, can be a source of precipitation directly onto Ganymede as well. Um, so yeah, so a, a mixture of loss and acceleration, as as we might expect. Uh, one thing I really did want to mention, um, particularly obviously moons, um, we have a lot of them, at Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and I, I alluded to earlier in, in the maps of the waves that um, some of the moons, at least, we've seen definite increases in, in various waves. So Rhea at Saturn, we've definitely got um, examples of, and Europa and Ganymede at Jupiter also for the chorus waves. Um, I am reliably told that there are more examples, but these are the published ones. Um, and that's really quite an interesting uh, prospect for, for many reasons, really. I mean, more waves is going to give you well, possibly more scattering or possibly more acceleration, depending on the plasma conditions. Um, working out the plasma conditions around the moon is going to be is quite a tricky uh, task that many people spend a lot of time doing. Um, so actually working out what's going to happen is, is going to be uh, a tricky, tricky task for the future. But more waves, more scattering or more acceleration 
Um, if you get more acceleration, you get more energetic particles, which gives you more weathering of the moon. And you can see those signatures on the moons um, from the radiation belts. Um, and that in itself might in actually induce more waves near the moons because you, you'll have um, lost cone um, anisotropies in the temperature. Um, and similarly, scattering, you might get auroras. Um, I mean, Ganymede is known to have ultraviolet auroras. Um, and uh, more weathering and sputtering, and again, possibly more weights. And so you're in this in incredible little uh, feedback loop, potentially, uh, of what's going on at the moons. And, and that's a really interesting, a really interesting target of work for the future. It's not trivial um, at all, but it's something that's really, really interesting. And, and uh, it's something uh, particular to, to Jupiter and Saturn radiation belt work. Uh, I wanted to throw in a quick bit of Uranus. Um, so Quentin showed some of this earlier. Um, and so Uranus is a really interesting, really interesting planet. So the, the magnetic uh, tilt is very large as a big magnetic offset. And when you start rotating that at approximately 17 hours, you get a, a magnetosphere that looks something like this. And this is um, a simulation from Fletcher et al. in 2020. Um, at the top of the screen, you see the sort of terrestrial one for comparison. So you might think, given that incredible uh, magnetospheric structure that you might not have any radiation belts in there at all. Um, however, the, the observations from Voyager, so Voyager went past Uranus in 1986, um, and there definitely was uh, an electron radiation belt and a proton radiation belt on both the inbound and outbound passes, um, which is, is quite incredible really. So there must be some sort of vaguely stable region in the middle of here for that to have, have been observed. Um, and from the, the waves point of view, we do have some waves data from the Voyager Pass. It's not a lot, um, but it's there. So I've, I've shown you um, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the time scale on which we're, we're looking at here, down here, it's, it's then blown up to show you. So we've got Chorus, we've got Hiss. Um, there's some other things in here as well that, that haven't been um, obviously identified. Um, trying to work out what these waves do under these circumstances and with very little knowledge about the plasma density is going to be tricky but given their interest in Uranus at the moment that's something that that I think we're going to have to try and do um, and hopefully we'll have a Uranus mission eventually. <laughs> um, so to summarise um, these are what I've been talking about uh, radial diffusion cyclotron resonant wave particle interactions um, and the rapid adiabatic transport um, which is that uh, global electric field driven adiabatic transport. Um, all of these are capable of both acceleration and loss at the outer planets, uh, depending on which direction in L you're going or which um, which way the energy goes between the waves and the particles. Um, and the details are complex, as, as they always tend to be. And um, as I said before, much more has been done than I've had time to cover here, uh, for which apologies for that, which I've not covered. Um, and thank you very much. Yeah, let's thank both Quinton and Emma for the really interesting talks. Uh, I saw there are already several questions uh, written in the chat. And also, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hands. I'll try to moderate the questions uh, within the given time. OK, the first comment is from Sasha regarding the zebra straps. Sasha, oh, that, was, that doesn't need to be read. <laughs> OK, <laughs> do you want to ask a follow up questions or comment? Just comment. Okay, okay. Then the next question is from Lin. Uh, Lin is asking about the uh, uh, electron to pl uh, uh, plasma to cyclotron frequency ratio. How I does that vary? I asked the question about two slides before the nice plots showing showing that. <laughs> so, okay. Sorry about okay. That. Do you have any follow up questions? <laughs> no, that was it. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, and there is a comment from Barry about emic wave at Jupiter, and um, he mentioned there is a study about observation of emic wave uh, from Ulysses mission from Lin et al. 1993 paper. Yeah, I guess this is about uh, for the comment uh, regarding your nice cartoon yeah? <laughs> showing all <laughs> the waves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. Sure. <clears throat> Okay, is there any other questions from the audience you'd like to ask? And please feel free to raise your hands and then try to and ask on live. That's also fine. Welcome. Okay, actually, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> 
So I think yeah, that uh, one of them is about uh, your wave cartoon. Yeah. So um, Emma, would you please share your wave cartoon again? So one okay. thing I noticed is that uh, the ECH wave in your wave cartoon actually extends to the pretty high latitude at Saturn. Do yeah. you have an idea why that happened? At <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm nearly there. Uh, sorry, I will stop the presentation. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, I don't know why, um, but this was Doug Magnetti's survey of 2017, um, and which which shows them, yeah, and, and not just one of the harmonics either, it's, it's multiple harmonics quite a long way off the equator, up to about sort of 40 degrees, I think it was. Um, and yeah, and whereas before we would have thought of equator, equator would. Um, and also, we obviously get bursts of the ECH waves in the in the interchange regions. You get little bursts of a whole multitude of harmonics coming off in the in interchange regions. Um, so yeah, that was quite a surprise. I don't know why, but yeah, <laughs> it's, in Doug, it's in Doug's survey. So um, it, yeah, it's the twenty seventeen paper. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And another question I have is about uh, the, the convection. So as well at the Earth, um, at convection uh, is probably play an important role at energy below, like a, a couple of energy. Uh, but at outer planets like uh, Jupiter and Saturn, how important is the convection process? Because we, uh, normal focal plant uh, simulation doesn't really have this convection, right? So, Shall I tell that one, Quentin? Do you want to do it? Say again what Emma presented nicely, uh, do, that we do have some evidence of maybe this is happening at Saturn. Uh -huh. uh, this is the best idea that we have to explain the zebra stripes. Uh, do you agree, Emma, on that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and it, and it's at Saturn, it's it's really put it's right in the middle of the energy range, so it's sort of a MEV or roundabouts. Yeah, and we we do have a second line of uh, evidence that uh, this can be an important process is we have bursts of MeV uh, electrons. Like, so basically you take the entire Galileo mission and you mm -hmm. take the above 11 MeV electrons, like super energetic. They stay all quiet within an envelope, except one day, uh, which is the C22 event. Uh, we don't know why, but uh, Elias Rousseau and colleagues, they have proposed that this can be uh, because of this convection electric field just very rapidly uh, transporting particles in world and increasing the, the phase space density. Um, not sure yeah. it is a firm conclusion, uh, but at least several lines of evidence that show that uh, we should incl include that in our models, uh, which is tricky, but well, we... Yeah, okay. and at Jupiter, so the, the main energy range is, is right up sort of the top end, which is the, the synchrotron interesting bit. Of the of the um of the radiation belt, so yeah, at Saturn it's right in the middle, which is a pain, and Jupiter <laughs> in the really interesting bit at the top. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. Uh, is there any other questions from the audience? Okay, if not, I would like to quickly plug in some very relevant uh, advertisement about our new fo gen focus group on the planetary a comparative planetary magnetospheric process, which will be launching from the GEM workshop this summer, led by the George Clark. And here is the full list of the uh, focus group leaders, as well as the draft agenda. As we can see, there are still a lot of open questions regarding uh, the comparative magnetospheric processes. And we're gonna try to address some of those open questions uh, yeah, in this uh, GEM uh, workshop. So you, you, you are very welcome to join us this summer in San Diego. And at last, I'd like to thank both speakers for the wonderful talks, as well as audience for attending and asking interesting questions. So we will announce the next seminar series separately later through emails and newsletters. Okay, thanks everyone and have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.